All right, here we go. Hi everyone, this is Chris the Primogen, and today we're going to talk about NPCs and power dynamics, the fundamental kindred of a city. This seminar was the second one I made uh, back in 2020, and it's surprisingly long. I read through it, it's over 30 slides. So there is a possibility that I will be splitting this up into two different uh, videos, depending on how long it is. Uh, last video, I rushed it out basically, so there were some problems with it. So I'm going to try to stay on topic with this one, try to be more relevant to the slide. I've adapted this, of course, to a live presentation I did with some of my patrons. If you recall, I mentioned that last video as well. So uh, it's sort of like a um, back and forth a little bit, uh, but most of the time I was monologuing, so it shouldn't be too different than this video. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments um, below. And uh, there's also going to be an exercise, which if you want to try it out, you can absolutely do that in the comments. So let's move on with NPCs and power dynamics, the fundamental kindred of a city. As you can probably guess, this is going to be about the NPCs of your uh, city in Vampire the Masquerade. So let's cover the content. It's uh, There's a lot. This It's a doozy. Um, it's your average Camarilla city. Some history on the Camarilla and how they rule over cities, basically. Some talk about stereotypes and how they can help and hinder, in terms of clans at least, and in Camarilla. There's the social network, No Man is an Island, which basically talks a little bit about how White Wolf likes to do their NPC relationship charts, which is actually something that I really enjoy uh, in terms of White Wolf um, uh, settings. They have these really interesting kind of, not flow charts, but like spiderweb-esque relationship charts that I really enjoy working with. The prints, some variations on the formula, and they tried and tested ones. So basically, how do White Wolf do their princes? How can you work with your prints? How can you kind of uh, stir up the pot, change things around a little bit to make them more interesting? Uh, the primogen, the prince's foil. And I think roughly around here, we might split the video into two, uh, depending on how long we make this, because I think the prince part is pretty long. But the primogen is, of course, the council of elders that support the prince or work against them, depending on the city. Uh, the creative session, the inner circle, this is an exercise, so this will probably be in the second video. Then we talk a little bit about the anarchs. We'll cover those more in a later video, I think. But are the anarchs necessary? And then you have the in-depths, the independents. Are they allowed in the city? For example, they might not be. Um, and then the Sabbat, of course. Are they around? Are they not around? What kind of an influence does the Sabbat have? Are they besieging the city? Are they, you know, spies? What kind of stuff is the Sabbat doing? The mortals, why are they important? They are important, spoiler. They're probably the most important NPCs in your city, uh, and I'll tell you why. And some other night folk, uh, which is a term that uh, my community uh, uses a lot. Um, I really enjoy it. I think it was Lauren that coined it to me. Uh, Night Folk is a good catch-all for uh, basically werewolves and mages and uh, ghosts and changelings and all that kind of stuff. So are they even relevant in your setting? These are all questions that are rhetorical. They are questions meant for you to kind of think about whether or not you want to have them in your game. And the reason for that is, of course, that a lot of people think that, oh, I got to have everything in my city or uh, they just do these things, you know, without really reflecting on them. So I want to kind of ask the kind of questions where you go like, oh, maybe I don't actually need these in my city. So you'll save yourself a lot of work. There's another creative session at the end there, uh, stirring the pot. I'm not entirely sure what that is. I forgot. Uh, it's been a little while since I had some um, some canker sores. So I haven't really read through this in a little while. And then some final reflections. So let's get on with the average Camilla city. Let's go with Chicago, which is of course, or is it Chicago? I think it's Chicago, ironically enough, because I was always taught that the ch sound is hard. We don't have that in Sweden, but Chicago, which of course is the one of the first cities created by White Wolf for a setting. The very first city is Indiana, Gary, or Gary, Indiana, um, which is very close to Chicago. But of course, that was in the first edition book, and that wasn't really a very well-developed setting. But your average Camarilla city, in fact, your archetypical Camarilla city is Chicago. And the reason for that is, well, there's a lot of different reasons, but the major reason is that it was the first city. 
it was the first city they made. Um, a lot of things they invented for that city, uh, they became basically the formula for Camarilla cities later on. So most people, consciously or not, kind of mirror the way that Chicago is constructed in the way they make their own cities. Chicago introduced the Prince, the Seneschal, the Primogen, which I don't even think was a thing in Gary because Gary was so small. Uh, you had the Sheriff, the Hounds, Keeper of Elysium, all these things. They were kind of introduced in the Chicago book or in the Chicago setting. Um, you had Anarchs um, and you had a long history of these Anarchs opposing the rulership of Loden. Uh, there was a civil war at a few points in history. There was a conflict between um, Gary and Chicago. And you had you, an, an actual threat towards the prince rulership was the Anarch groups and the workers unions, all these things. You also had the independent clans working together in the shadows towards their own goals. You had the Giovanni, you had the um, Setites, now the, the ministry. Uh, you had all these things happening in the background. The Banu Hakim, the Asamites were there as well, I think. There's, of course, also the Sabbat threat, which I think was introduced in the second edition of Chicago by Night. I think there's three... No, I think just four editions of Chicago. Uh, no, two or three editions. Three editions. Um, there's the first and second edition of Chicago, uh, before and after the war with the werewolves. Uh, and then you have, of course, Chicago by Night for V5, which is the third edition of, of Chicago. So in the second edition, they introduced a few Sabbat. And the second edition came out pretty early, like mid-90s, I think. But there definitely was a Sabbat threat. Uh, at the outskirts of the city. So they had the pack described in the, in the book. Uh, mortal institutions. Um, there wasn't a lot of information about these in the Chicago source books, but I think they're very important because they're kind of the, 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 the playing pieces of the prince and the primogen. The, you had the police, you had the mental institute that uh, Sun was involved in. Uh, you have... Uh, of course, um, hospitals, blood banks, all these kind of things. Nightclubs. Nightclubs are definitely a very prevalent mortal institution. I don't know if you can call it that institution, but definitely a prevalent mortal faction in, in V5 especially. You also, of course, had the violent clash with the city's Garou, leaving the kindred population decimated. This is the major event that happens in between first and second edition of Chicago by Night. And uh, this is a under a blood red moon, I believe it's called. Um, I think, unless that's actually a, a detective game. Let me get the book here. Um, no, it is right. I'm right. It's called under a blood red moon. Sorry, I had to had to check the books. Um, there is a uh, there's a point and click adventure game, something blood red moon as well. I think. Uh, I mixed it up with, I, I thought I mixed it up with. So, of course, Chicago is the first major city. Well, no, actually, Gary, Indiana is the first major city. And that was in first edition of Vampire. So in the very, very first core rulebook, you had a, um, a sample chronicle setting, which was Gary. And you had Prince Modius, a Toreador, uh, who was opposed by Juggler, the Anarch, a Bruja. Um, and they were kind of also uh, influenced by the ever-looming presence of Loden of Chicago. So you had Loden. I, I don't know if Loden is mentioned in V1. Um, should probably check that out. But Modius is definitely defined by his city's failure uh, against Chicago in terms of growth, in terms of industry. There is no primogen in uh, Gary. Uh, there are very, very few kindred. I think there's like six or seven kindred all in all described in the book. Most of which are more interested in what's going on in Chicago rather than what's going on in Gary. There are no formal roles uh, with any kind of authority. You have Modius and he's probably the only authority you have in the city. Um, and Juggler is kind of like the, the leader of the, uh, the Anarch. So when Vampire was first designed, it was very much a street level kind of uh hanging out in the parking lots um 
a very small scale in that sense. So if you really want to have a good look at a small city, how, how the people at White Wolf imagined a small city of vampires would work like, you can go check out V1 and how they described Gary, uh, Indiana. I think Gary's also in Chicago by night, the first book. I think they also describe it in there. And I think the Succubus Club, there are a couple of source books, early source books that um, flesh out Gary a little bit more. There's also a dedicated vampire hunter called Sullivan Dane and an FBI agent, Agent Shepard. And these are kind of the template vampire hunters that sort of serve as the primordial basis for White Wolf's future excursions into the society of St. Leopold and Hunters Hunted, the Project Twilight, that kind of stuff. So these two NPCs are very important. They're kind of the, the, the crucible from which all the other uh, characters later came out of. There's the Forged in Steel Chronicle with Ashes to Ashes and Dust to Dust. I think Dust to Dust is a V20 supplement that was created to kind of follow up the Ashes to Ashes, which was one of the very first uh, pre-made adventures released for Vampire the Masquerade. So Ashes to Ashes came first, and then Dust to Dust came a lot later. And both of them kind of involved Sullivan Dane. I think uh, Sullivan is also part of Dust to Dust, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but the Forged in Steel Chronicle is the template chronicle that V1 used to show people how to kind of structure your, your settings. Um, the stakes are extremely low in these games. It's very local. If you're a V20 fan or if you're a uh, revised edition fan, you're definitely more used to having uh, worlds... Well, not necessarily more used to, but, but v, uh, V20 and... and and uh, Revised Edition are definitely more aligned towards uh, international gameplay, more aligned towards, uh, uh, you know, conflicts between vampire factions, um, higher stakes, basically. So V1 and V2, to a lesser degree, uh, were very centered around one small city, a small cluster of vampires, and generally kind of nightly affairs that were in the grand scale of things in the grand scope of things pretty small so that's your first city it was small stakes like who's going to be um who's going to be ch in charge of tonight's elysium that kind of stuff so if you're a seasoned storyteller you probably ran a couple of adventures like that you probably had oh um the elysium is tonight and uh, the prince is upset so we have to placate him so the party will go as it should be going so that's that's kind of how white wolf started out with their their story their storytelling rather what can we learn from all this well cities are islands and roads are sea lanes. This is something I always really want to drive home when I'm talking about vampire with people. Um, you can't think of the world the way we human beings think of the world. For me, uh, going to Gothenburg from Stockholm, that's a matter of buying a train ticket or even a bus ticket, and I'm there. Uh, the chances of me uh, being in mortal peril on the way is close to zero. Even flying to America, even uh, traveling across America, not necessarily the most dangerous thing, probably more dangerous of course than going to Gothenburg but flying across the Atlantic is not a big deal today not so much for vampires it is um, there's a reason each city has a prince and the reason is of course that traveling between cities as a vampire is a very dangerous affair you have werewolves you have accidentally being exposed to sunlight you have betrayal all these kind of things can happen to you so in general, um, you're either very foolhardy, you're very experienced, or you're very desperate if you want to move to another city in Vampire. Um, so cities are definitely like islands. They're not nation states because there are no clear borders between cities. There's a lot of wilderness in between. So I like to picture, for example, America, you could literally draw up a map and make it an ocean and then have cities being islands and, and small rest stops being like um, reefs, all that kind of stuff. That's a really good image to have in mind when you're making a vampire city. Roads are sea lanes traveled. Um, these can, of course, alter and change. Some sea lanes are more dangerous and more dangerous at certain times of the year. And I think roads just the same. There could be Garou there. There could be uh, all kinds of nasty stuff waiting for you. There is, of course, also no unified Camarilla system. There is no unified Anarch system either. Um, 
Revised and V20 to some degree were very good at making you think there is. Because, of course, by the time that Revised rolled out, uh, the Camarilla was pretty set in stone. But if you go read any of the By Night books, you will realize that it's not quite that simple. Uh, no single vampire city is ruled exactly the same way as another one. <clears throat> and part of that is because there aren't that many kindred. Uh, part of that is because every prince is unique, and so all their courts have to be unique in that case too. Um, you can't have a unified system. You can have systems similar to each other, but Mithras would be running London way different to how um, any other city, really. He's so powerful, he, the only reason he would have a council is because he can't do everything on his own. He doesn't want to do everything on his own, so he kind of unloads a lot of work on his lessers. Whereas Loden ran things quite similar to Mithras, but Loden wasn't really that powerful. He was embraced in the 1800s. So he had to constantly rely on the goodwill of his primogen, who were, by the way, also not that weak. His primogen were actually quite powerful, so they worked as a really good counterbalance against Loden's princedom. And then, of course, the Anarch Free States, the AFS, uh, California, large parts of California, uh, they kind of became the model of, of how prim uh, Primarchs, Anarchs worked. Um, I'm getting my, my uh, settings mixed up here. Uh, and then, of course, you had um, you had the classic small groups of anarchs in every city, which were Camarilla Light. So, revised and partly V20 kind of dismissed, well, didn't dismiss, but downplayed the importance of the anarchs in their settings, whereas the anarchs were very important in V1 and V2 and in V5. So, there is no unified anarch system. I think V5 did this really well in their anarch book because they, the point of the anarch book in V5 is to show you that being an anarch is, is a state of mind rather than a certain set of principles or rules. Uh, you're an anarch if you say you're an anarch and you don't follow the Camarilla system. Uh, and the Camarilla has become much more hierarchical. I hate that word, I can never pronounce it correctly. Uh, and has become a lot more insulated in V5. Uh, so the Camarilla system has actually gone more towards a certain kind of way to be ruled, whereas the Anarch system has splintered a, a lot more. Also worth pointing out is that uh, the Camarilla system in Chicago in V5 is very, very different from the Chicago system in V1. The, the city itself has kind of evolved as certain primogen members have left and new ones have filled their spots. There are some key players you will need to have in your city, but you can shake up the formula. It's more important to think of like power and power um, relativity rather than like, okay, the Seneschal has this amount of power, the Sheriff has this amount of power. That That's not a good way to approach it, I, th I feel, uh, because your Sheriff could be extremely powerful, but very, very honor bound, for example, or could own the Prince a massive boon and therefore works for the Prince. Like if you look at uh, bloodlines, for example, in bloodlines, the, the 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 sheriff is quite possibly more powerful than Lacroix, but he works for Lacroix. We never find out why, um, and we don't have to find out why because that's just part of the setting. The sheriff is extremely powerful, and he works for the prince for some reason. We don't know why. Many cities have very few vampires, including include more mortals. I was gonna say including more mortals. Well, very few. Many cities have less mortals. Um, but yes, a, a big mistake uh, many uh, storytellers make, myself included, is to go, okay, I need uh, 5 Tremere, I need uh, 12 Torridor, I need 6 Bruja. If you don't have a very big city, uh, the city is going to get very crowded, and it's going to be very hard to keep track of all your NPCs and vampires and their hunting grounds and their domains and whatnot. So consider having more mortals. It can be boring to make a mortal character when you're working on making vampires, um, but really, um, mortal characters should should exist. Um, vampire hunters should exist. There should be ghouls. There should be uh, corporate CEOs. There should be politicians. All these kind of things. Because honestly, those are the ones that your players will probably encounter more. Unless you want to make a very vampire-centric uh, story. Which, there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of times... Uh, it makes more sense for vampires to interact more with mortals rather than with other vampires unless they meet them for Elysium. Those kind of things. There are certain kindred that are more likely to be encountered, like uh, 
uh, Sheriff or Seneschal, but keep the big hitters uh, to a few choice encounters so as to not reduce the impact of them being there. You can also do the opposite. You can overpopulate your city. This is especially relevant for cities ruled by Anarchs or Sabbat. They don't really care too much about maintaining the masquerade, at least not to the degree that the Camarilla does. And more importantly, they don't care too much about power balance in the same way, unless they're very smart Camarilla or Sabbat. Uh, power balance is very uh, delicate. Mostly the prince will want a word in how, when, how and when you embrace because they want to make sure that you don't become too powerful, that you don't create an army to oppose them. That is literally the reason that law exists. They say it's to maintain the, the masquerade, which is fair, but the rule of one vampire per 100,000 citizens is kind of, kind of extreme. I think, uh, considering how you don't really need to feed every night, um, if you're careful, I, I think you can have a lot more vampires per capita um, and still get away with it. But I think it definitely the major reason you don't get to embrace that much is because the Camarilla princes want to make sure you don't uh, you don't overrule them. No, you don't um, overcome them in terms of power. And then finally, you gotta think about what makes your city special. So every by night book uh, is of course a different by night book. They don't just release a template book and go, oh, okay, now it's New York, now it's Montreal, now it's Chicago, now it's London. Because really, uh, that would be very boring. Uh, I think Berlin by night is like a horror example of how to make your city special. I, I don't recommend that book. Berlin by night is not a good book. But you have books like Montreal by Night, which is interesting, released by Black Dogs. It's kind of hard to find these days, especially the physical copy. Uh, but you have Mexico City by Night, which is another Sabbat city, very different from Montreal. You have Chicago by Night. You have New York by Night. Um, you have Cairo by Night, which is a very interesting book. So really uh, check out these books if you can and learn from them. Like there's always something different about these cities. Even Berlin has something different in them uh, for good or bad. But let's go to stereotypes, which is a place to start when creating vampires. Modius and Juggler, the Tremere, no, not Tremere, Torador, Prince, and the Bruja Anarch. Now, they're very, very different characters in this game. You have the foppish, kind of self-absorbed, kind of neurotic Torador Prince. I would argue is a classical uh, stereotype for Torador. And then you have the ringleader Bruja Anarch who's down with the kids. He he knows the lingo. He's very chill. He's very easy to get along with and he's kind of manipulative. And the Torador Prince is likewise a powerful vampire but he's hindered by his neuroses and his sense of inferiority to Loden. There is a strange codependency between these two vampires. Uh, Modius probably uh, is happy to have um, Juggler around because Juggler is a much more manageable threat than Loden is. Loden is so beyond Modius in terms of power, at least that's how uh, both Loden and Modius see it, that Modius can actually kind of boss around or at least yell at Juggler without feeling like he's going to get killed. Juggler, meanwhile, uh, has this small city to play around in he knows the stakes are low. Uh, he knows Chicago is the big fish, but he, he comes to Gary basically to feel like a big man because he's kind of small in Chicago. He's not a very uh, important kindred there, but in, in Gary, Indiana, he is the opposition. He is the big cheese in the small city. So both of these vampires have a sense of inferiority to their biggest city, to Chicago, and they just kind of play their own little jihad in Gary. Chicago is the ever-present reminder of how small they are. So it's kind of the enabler of this relationship. And I think both of these kindred would probably also uh, act out more if they didn't have each other. They might even move towards becoming bigger players. Like Modius used to be a major power broker a long time ago. But of course he was broken by Loden quite thoroughly and now uh, kind of wallows in his own misery. So Modius fell from grace and Juggler is of course also a servant. He is blood bound to others. He is under the control and manipulation of vampires far more powerful <clears throat> pardon me, than himself. Uh, he's actually a puppet 
which is interesting because Modius is fairly free. Modius is so unimportant that he's not really being manipulated, even though he's the childer of the Torador Primogen of Chicago. Modius doesn't really matter. Uh, so he's kind of uh, um, not very manipulated, whereas Juggler, uh, all the way up to Helena, has uh, a lot of manipulation going on there. He's not even his own man, which I, I'm not sure if he knows about it, but it's, it's ironic that the, the Anarch leader is the one who's a puppet. So that's a very, that's a very interesting kind of setting. Uh, it, it looks very stereotypical on the surface, but when you dig further into it, you realize that it has some curveballs that would just kind of stir the pot, change things around a little bit for the better. Then of course you have the, um, the equivalents in Chicago, the Anarch leader and the, uh, the Camarilla Prince. You have Loden and Mold Davis. Now Mold Davis is a Kaitif, uh, but she is a Tremere by clan. She is the childer of the, I don't remember his name, not the primogen of Tremere, but she is a Tremere by blood although she doesn't know her sire. But you have the Ventrue self-made prince. Loden is, uh, despite all his flaws, and there are many, a very self-made guy. He started out as a soldier in the Civil War, if I'm not mistaken, um, <clears throat> and then got embraced, uh, learned from his sire, who was prince, I believe, or the lover of a prince. I should have really done my research before this. But then he came to Chicago, he saw an opportunity, he seized it, and then he's ruthlessly uh, controlled Chicago up until the mid-90s. Uh, through thick and thin, he's learned to bend the knee when he has to. He, his modus operandi is that he, um, if he finds a new venue of power, he will embrace a good potential candidate for a childer in that, in that business. Uh, to make sure that he can control it. So, oh, the stock market is growing. I'm going to get a stockbroker. Oh, the, these gangs are growing in Chicago. I'm going to get a gang leader. Uh, he's very, he's a very entrepreneur kind of venture. He knows how to uh, diversify his portfolio. Then you have the rebel rouser. Uh, Mel Davis is a very good speaker. She, she's the salt of the earth. She's good at um, rising... Uh, up against injustices. So she's also, incidentally, we'll get to that later, but she's not quite as simple as she looks. But she's definitely someone who came from nothing and she's a very strong uh, proponent of uh, kindred rights. She talks a lot about how Loden and his crew are running the city. So she's a very uh, relatable, very um, easy to support kind of, kind of a kaitif, as she's called. Uh, she also has the primogen's backing, which is very interesting because the primogen in Chicago, like I mentioned before, are very, very powerful. Um, Loden only rules because they allow him to rule, which is something he doesn't really want to acknowledge. But there are the primogen are very powerful. They're very old. Uh, they have a lot of stakes in the city. And some of them are manipulated as well by the uh, Methuselah under, under Chicago um, the two Methuselah who have been at war with each other for a long, long time. So either of these kindred, their rise and fall is pretty much decided on whether or not they have the primogen's backing. And you would be right to ask, well, why would the caitiff rebel rouser have the primogen's backing? But the truth is that uh, Maldavis would have never gotten to where she was if she didn't have primogens secretly backing her, providing her support. Uh, and once they stopped doing that, her entire movement kind of just crumbled on itself, which is something that happens in between first and second edition of Chicago. Meanwhile, Loden has continuously um, reached further than his grasp could take, and he's had to um, sort of turn to the primogen and bend the knee and apologize and humiliate himself to know his place in order to succeed. I think that happened with uh, both with um, with Moldavis, but also previously previous anarch movements as well. I think Gary Indiana has kind of been his pet project because I don't think the primogen cares that much about Gary. So he's been able to do whatever he wants with it as a sort of side project, which means that he ruthlessly destroyed uh, Gary's steel industry uh, because he didn't like Modius. So you have the prince, who's ironically uh, not a puppet in this case. Uh, Loden was kind of manipulated in a certain sense, but Moldavis' entire movement 
was built on deception and support by the primogen. So again, you have these two very classical Ventru, Kaitif, uh, Camarilla, Anarcho positions. But then when you dig a little further, you realize that they're actually just puppets in a much, much grander scheme. And the prince, ironically, less so than the Kaitif Anarch. So um, this is something that I feel Revised Era and V20 didn't stop doing, but it became less less secret, I guess. Less, uh, you, I mean, you had all these ancient vampires manipulating everything, but this game, um, V1 and V2 Chicago really went all out, so to speak. They really said, okay, here's the entire power chain, the entire structure, all the way down to the Methuselah, who's controlling the city. And very few other books did that. Almost every By Night book has like, oh, here's an ancient horror lurking or, or in Torpor or whatever. But Chicago really went all out in terms of like, okay, this is the entire power structure of this city. So it's a very bad book to read if you're a player. Now, Chicago has been around for a long time, so I don't think this is, should be considered spoilers. But um, if you're a player uh, and you read Chicago By Night, you will realize there's literally... Uh, all the way down to street level, there's manipulation going on. Which is why I think Chicago is still the best uh, foundation for Vampire Chronicle, because it has this... Um, it really captures the, the element of elders versus the young generations, the, the uh, jihad, the eternal struggle uh, between the old and the young. Chicago is a great example of how that works. But what are these stereotypes? What, 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 what do I mean when I say stereotypes? Well, we're talking about clans, right? So I'm gonna go through all the clans and I'm gonna talk about like the classic kind of stereotypes and then we're gonna kind of provide counter examples for these. Like what would they, what would they be different? Like how can you twist the stereotype into, some, into something else? So the Banu Hakim or the formerly called Asamites, they're the judge, the jury, the executioner. You have a Judge Dredd kind of characters could be one extreme. You have ninjas with katanas is another extreme, but basically they're vampire assassins. They're assassins of vampires, they're the judges of vampires. In, in earlier editions, they were literally just assassins, and then they kind of just explored these further in the revised era. Uh, one of the best clan books is the revised uh, clan book for Banu Hakim, Rasamites, because it shows them how shows how they are um, the judges of vampires, the upholders of Cain's laws, basically. Uh, you had the Bruja, they're the philosophers and the hot-blooded ones, the anarchs embodied. Um, something really interesting with Chicago is you have both the the Anarch and the Camarilla Bruja are, are in the book, and they, there's a very clear separation between them. You have uh, Critias, who is the um, Bruja uh, Primogen, who is a very Camarilla loyal um, Bruja. And then you have, of course, all the, the Anarchs and that kind of stuff. So the Bruja are philosophers first, but they're also uh, fighters. They fight for what they believe in. Not necessarily believing in, in, in something good. They can definitely believe in fascist ideologies, all that kind of things. But they're, they, they, they believe in things. They fight for ideas. The Gangrel, they're animalistic loners and outsiders. They don't care too much about politics. They're very uh, insular. They, they don't like to get locked up in things. And politics is all about like having uh, resources, having power, and power means you have to stay in one place. So a lot of gangrel don't care about politics because it means you have stakes and stuff, which means it's hard to move on if you feel you feel the need to move on. The Hekata, the Giovanni previously, the very insular necromancers and mobster merchants. Now the Hekata of V5 is very different from the Giovanni of previous editions. The Giovanni were all about diversifying their assets. They were about getting involved as much as possible without breaking the truce they had with the Camarilla. So the Giovanni were not allowed to get involved in Camarilla politics. That was part of the truce they made with the Camarilla a long, long time ago. But they were allowed to get involved in mortal businesses. So the lines were kind of blurred in that sense, but the Giovanni were like family first. That, that was their thing. Uh, so they they basically employed a lot of uh, dirty tricks to to dominate different kind of trades. I think they were involved in the, the hospital businesses in Chicago, for example. The Hekata is not very different. Uh, they're actually kind of just, um, in V5, they're sort of 
uh, go, trying to regain what they might have lost during the little bit of a struggle when, when the family kind of got reorganized. But they're very focused on making money and power for their family. The Lazambra are Darwinist nobles who put victory before all else. Darwinism means survival of the fittest. So the Lazambra are very... They're kind of uh, hardcore, um, I would argue perhaps libertarian, if I was to put a political mark on them, or possibly even a narco-capitalist. Like, they don't really care too much about rules unless the rules are in their favor or unless they would lose prestige if they broke the rules. But where you have the Ventru who are very noblesse oblige in their approach, they, they, they at least feel they have a responsibility. La Sombra are in it for the power, uh, more so than what the power uh, requires them to do. The La Sombra are leaders, but they are not necessarily bound by the same code of honor that a Ventru would be. They're more about like winning because they want to win. Um, and they believe that the strongest survive. They tend to put their future child through a very uh, horrible uh, set, set of trials just to make sure that they have what it takes to be a La Sombra. The Mulcavians are very unpredictable, and they're also very dangerous, and they're easily underestimated. They are the seers, they are the soothsayers, they are the jesters of the court, the ones who can speak truth to power and get away with it. They are um, can be princes. It's not it's not very uncommon for them to be princes. Uh, they're generally a little bit of everything. You can find a Mulcavian who acts in any of the other classes' ways. Um, they are sort of... Um, they're sort of... Uh, they're hard to pin down in that sense. Uh, Malkavians who are unpredictably, hilariously, jokishly joker, Batman type joker, not so much fun, but Malkavians can be very insightful. They're good advisors. I would say every prince should have a Malkavian to listen to because Malkavians tend to have a lot of insight into political matters, into people's behaviors, those kind of things. A lot of Malkavians want to understand themselves and in so doing, learn to understand other people very good, very well even. You have the followers of Set now called the Ministry. They are the purveyors of vice and sin, and they barter in secret, barter in secrets and artifacts. And what I mean by that is that, um, just like the Hekata, just like the Giovanni, uh, the Ministry are very uh, clan first. They're very focused on uh, improving their own lot. Uh, they, they, um, not necessarily follow... They, they used to be a lot more of a religious cult. Now it's more like they're enablers. They like to help people explore their darker sides. Um, the ministry tend to be playing in the shadows. They tend to provide whatever you need, but for a price. Uh, they're also... Uh, they're also generally kind of trying to remain neutral because they want to be like uh, everyone's friend. So the ministry tend to be very easily approachable. They tend to focus on the long play. They don't necessarily want to do the worst things first. They want to make sure that you trust them before they start manipulating you. The Nosferatu, they're the um, spies and hackers to live underground. They're disfigured. They can't move around in public. They're very like other clans are very insular in the sense that they like to keep together. The Nosferatu are probably the most clan loyal Camarilla, or Camarilla uh, imaginable. This is more out of necessity rather than any kind of sympathy or passion, although there's definitely that as well. But the Nosferatu know that if they don't have each other's backs, they will definitely find themselves in situations that are against, you know, against their uh, own well-being. So the ministry will probably, ministry, the Nosferatu uh, tend to keep together. They live in little underground uh, collective havens. They're very good at spying. Their clan disciplines are good for that. Uh, a lot of them are hackers or, or you know, needs, not in employment, education or training, so to speak. They, they don't work day jobs. They don't have a huge social network. So they can kind of focus on uh, this, these kind of uh, one man jobs, these kind of one person things. The Ravnos, um, 
they're very hard to pin down, possibly even harder than Malkavians. They're con men. They like to trick people. They like to, uh, um, they like to, they're, they're kind of addicted to a certain vice. Um, they're a clan who has undergone a lot of changes recently. They, they're, they're, uh, they're um, <clears throat> antediluvian may or may not be dead, but there's not a lot of them around anymore. There's usually not a lot of them in any city at a given time. Probably because most uh, princes know that Ravnos are... Both are traveling, of course. They don't like to stay in one place. But a lot of princes know that don't mess with them. Give them whatever space they need and they'll move on. They won't bother you. Um, and they're, they're kind of left to their own device. This is kind of a hard clan to play because uh, they've undergone so many changes. You have the Torador. Also, by the way, the reason I'm going through some of these clans faster than others is because, of course, the, the Camarilla clans are generally more city-bound. Like the Ministry, the Hekata, the Ravnos, like all the, um, the Banu Hakim before, they're part of the Camarilla now. <clears throat> the independent clans used to be way more focused on, on their own clan rather than any kind of faction. So they're not interesting in the sense of a Camarilla city because they're still very uh, clan focused. They're, they're kind of, they're even more stereotypical, I would say, than, than uh, other clans because when they were first created, they were basically created to be, uh, oh yeah, this clan is Italian mobsters, this clan is vampire assassins, this clan is uh, uh, selling drugs, and this clan is uh, traveling, well, travelers, basically. Uh, so yeah, the the independent clans are not we're not quite as fleshed out as the the original seven Camarilla clans, but the Torador, they have the artistic Epicureans who seek passion and adoration. The Torador are very very invested in humanity to various degrees. They like the Ventru. They they care a lot about their mortal pawns because they they love that kind of creative spark that mortals have they're very fickle they like emotion uh they like social interaction the torador tend to be um they they, t they try to kind of enjoy themselves they're terrified of ennui they're terrified of uh of of longer uh longer uh, torpor they they want to kind of experience the, the creative joy and and passion of life uh, they're also very political, they like to manipulate, they like to play games, they, they are social butterflies, those kind of things. The Tremere used to be extremely powerful, not quite so much in V5 anymore, but they're very secretive and paranoid. They're probably the, the most clan before anything in the, in the Camarilla, even more so than Nosferatu, I would believe. They are sorcerers with one very specific goal, they, will, they want more power. Uh, they were they used to be very bound to their clan because they were blood bound to their clan not so much anymore and the the Tremere tend to be the the most difficult clan to deal with for the Sabbat because the Tremere always have a chantry they tend to always be prepared for war they went through a very um very dangerous crucible in the dark ages when they first became a clan literally almost everyone hated them so they learn to kind of prioritize themselves before anyone else. Uh, there's a lot of backstabbing going on within the clan, but up until V5, they were definitely the most powerful uh, clan because they kept together very, very tightly. The Tsimish or the Tsimitsi or how, however you want to pronounce them, um, they are still very vaguely defined. I still think this, this is one of the vaguest clans of them all, uh, at least the I think I miss yeah I misspelled that there. There's some it's me. There's there's one I too many uh, in that name. <laughs> Should have spell checked. Uh, they're monsters who would rather rule over a ruin than give anything away. And I think that's possibly the best description you can get of them. They're dragons, in the sense that what's mine is mine. You touch it and die. And I think that kind of applies to both new Tsimitsi and old Tsimitsi. Uh, old clan Tsimitsi are more like Dracula from, from, from Bram Stoker's Dracula, the movie. If you want a really good stereotype for Tsimitsi, however you want to say that. Uh, but e even younger ones tend to be very possessive of what they have. But this is a clan that's hard to describe because they're just freaks. And that's kind of how they were portrayed in a lot of editions. And in V5... We have very little information about them. 
we only have the very uh, short bit of text in the player's guide stuff that was released at the end of 2020. Uh, so the Tzmish, we don't know how they've evolved or changed over the years. But before you start typing in the comments, this is how you pronounce this. There is no single way to pronounce this. They changed uh, the pronunciation different ways around. I know that Revised Era had one way to pronounce it. I don't care. I think it's Timitse in that book. So I think that speaks for itself. Don't care. Pronounce it however you want it to. The Ventru, they're the greedy nobility who see themselves as chosen rulers of their kind. They're very mean focused. Um, they want power, but unlike the La Sombra, they want power because they think they are utterly convinced that they are the best people for the job. Uh, noblesse oblige, which I mentioned earlier, is basically the, the obligations of nobility, which is a term that used to go around a lot in, uh, in the uh, Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, uh, because nobility had a responsibility. They were in charge of their domain, which meant that they had to make sure that their domain prospered. Uh, I was actually in a conversation not too long ago with some people about uh, the um, how, how nobility could be kind of uh, distant from from the general people in that time and I think I think that's an unfair assessment because I think death uh, and violence and suffering was a lot more common back then and you kind of had to take a step back and look at the bigger picture if you were a nobility like yes it's a tragedy that my peasants are starving for example but on the other hand if i don't stock up food now if i'm a good nobility by the way there's plenty of examples of bad nobles um then uh, in two years when the plague shows up uh, everyone will die so i think the the ventru uh, whether or not it's it's true see themselves as the wise uh leader who looks at the big picture a lot more so they consider themselves leaders because they have the gumption they have the uh, they have the strength to kind of rule. That's that's what they believe in. However, why are these stereotypes bad? Well, first of all, you have the chicken and the egg dilemma. Like, are these stereotypes stereotypes because that's how people play them, or are they are people playing them that way because they're stereotypes? And I think um, a lot of new players kind of go. I think actually most new players don't really follow stereotypes. They go, okay, this clan is like this uh, class in D&D, so that's what I'm going to go with, which is an interesting approach, uh, but very quickly you learn. I, th I think it's just part of the cultural mitosis of playing vampire that very quickly you're exposed to stereotypes, uh, both through online communities and through art and through games. Because when we story tell, we, t we tend to, oh, that's just a ventru. Like bad storytelling goes, a ventru comes up to you and does this. Um, so clans are kind of a trap. They very easily pull you into the stereotype and you, you start repro reproducing the stereotype without even knowing why. <clears throat> All vampires were once mortal. So even before you start thinking about what clan they are, uh, you might want to start thinking about what kind of a personality they have and then either uh, subvert that personality or or follow along with it where they embrace despite who they are or because of who they are um, sometimes these stereotypes can be very predictable and cliche which for a storyteller can be very dangerous because if you have a venture prince players will definitely treat them differently than how they would treat a bruja prince for example so a bruja prince could be just as um, Manipulative and ruling, and that's my cat snoring, by the way, uh, could be just as predictive, could be just as manipulative and uh, noble as a Ventru, a Bruja, Bruja prince could be. Um, and a Ventru could be just as much of an anarch as a Bruja could be, but we tend to not see that when we first meet them. So if you make a very predictable, stereotypical character, the players might even feel like they're pulled out of the game because you're you're playing with stereotypes. It's kind of uninspiring. It's kind of boring. Um, all the examples we've seen before of Loden and Modius and, and Juggler and Maldavis, they have a twist. They are the stereotype. They're literally one of the first some of the first NPCs created. So they are obviously stereotypical, but not not they're not just their stereotype. Not even Loden is just a manipulative, powerful Ventru. There are depths and angles to that character that twists the concept around. So even back then, 
even back then, uh, White Wolf were aware of the stereotypes and they worked around them. They worked to twist them around. Um, the stereotypes can also be harmful. Uh, I'm not even going to go into the whole Rob Nose thing, but like, um, I'm just going to say uh, World of Darkness Gypsies and we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, some stereotypes. Vampire doesn't suffer quite as much from this as Werewolf does because Werewolf... Oh boy. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into that, I said, but um, stereotypes can be kind of... Um, they can be harmful. Like, um, yeah, I'm going to have a Bruja gangbanger or I'm going to have a Tsimitsi Nazi scientist, you know. These were things that... These are things that exist. You have Dr. Totenkopf or whatever, who's a Tsimitsi Nazi... It's a whole thing. Like, they dropped that character, but first edition clan books were something else um you have to kind of remember that vampire was released in the 90s and the late 80s the early 90s mid 90s was a very very different time and i'm not just saying that because i'm from i was born in the 80s the 90s was a time of stereotypes the 90s was a time of subculture subcultures exist today uh i I've, i definitely they exist but they're so split they're so diverse that people don't really People don't say I'm a goth these days. Like you can have a goth style, you can have a goth girl fashion, you know, but you're not necessarily a goth. You don't listen to the same bands as all the other goths do. You don't hang at the goth places. You don't smoke clothes. Like in the 90s, if you were goth, you did all the things that goth people do. Or you, there were subgroups of goth, of course, but to most people, goth were just one thing. Um, punk was one thing. Um, you had... Um, ska skinheads all those kind of things these were actual subcultures that had a very specific kind of cultural expression and this is what vampire was inspired by a vampire was inspired by the 90s subculture um that were actually cultures they were very um solid they had art fashion uh famous people within that subculture they had expressions all these things i don't think we live in a time where that is the case because if you call someone a weeb, a weeaboo, a, a fan of anime, that in itself is such a washed out denominator right now that it doesn't really say anything about a person except that they're supposedly kind of cringe. Um, whereas a, 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 a an otaku from the 90s have a very specific kind of uh, uh, behavior, stuff they watched. Like our culture has been so diversified right now that it's very difficult to kind of pin yourself down as a specific kind of subculture. So keep that in mind when you're reading older books that the 90s was a very, very different time. It can also lead to a lack of depth to get back on topic. Like your stereotypes, um, <clears throat> if, if that's all the character is, uh, then it's going to be hard to role play that character. Like if, if you don't have a good grasp of a character, aside from the fact that they're a manipulative Ventru, when the players do something that makes that Ventru happy, your, your your response as a storyteller might not be that uh, good because you, you, you never stop to think, what if the players make this venture their ally? How do I act? How do I react to that? So always think about character first and stereotype second uh, or twist the stereotype around because that's the thing. You make you make this NPC and you're like, oh, the players are going to hate this character or they're going to make enemies with this character. And then the players suddenly start to try to appease them and make them part of their group or make them, you know, uh, uh, someone they want to hang out with. And you realize, oh, shit, I've never thought about how this character would act if they were friends with someone. So always try to have these kind of options open because otherwise you're going to default to your aggressive non-friendly behavior and if there's something that really kills a good uh, a good game or really shows the seams of your game it is when the uh, the npcs act in a stereotypical kind of uh, npc manner they don't they they lack the depth or spcs storyteller player characters uh, or npcs not player characters so always keep in, keep your options open in terms of your SPCs. Make sure that they're they're believable. You don't want to show the seams. You don't want to show that this guy is supposed to be the bad guy, because then that kind of just reduces the the level of realism in your game. Stereotypes can be good, however. Um, they're a good foundation to start on when you're designing your your characters. All right, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna play. So I'll just read up on the Gangrel 
and then I'll start there, and then I'll kind of flesh them out along the way. Um, oh, I need a, I need a, a Banu Hakim Primogen. I don't know that much about the Banu Hakim. I will read a little bit in the Camrilla book. Okay, I got a good idea. I will start. I will make a uh, former uh, state uh, prosecutor. There you go. That's that's my Banu Hakim. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it helps you create the mortal as well, because clans obviously want to embrace someone who fits with that clan. So, you, uh, most of the time, a Ventru is going to be a stereotypical Ventru, because that's the kind of people that the Ventru like to embrace. So, obviously, you will not find people breaking too far away from that mold. You will, it, it will be very hard-pressed to find a Torador who is in no way at all capable of producing art. They exist, but that in itself makes them a, uh, a par pariah in their clan, but also a very strange kind of character. So you want to keep that in mind. You want to make sure that you don't stray too far away from the mold unless you have a very specific idea about it. And I think in, in a bigger scope, this goes for literally everything, you don't want to break away from tropes or predictable stories or like story structure unless you really know what you're doing if you fully understand this clan then you can start breaking the mold and change things around i, I it's a very fundamental idea but a lot of people approach storytelling a lot of people approach writing as a sense of okay i'm gonna do this but different okay but why are you doing it different what are you changing and why do you think it is like this to begin with why do you think this uh, trope exists and if you don't understand why that trope exists changing it just because you want to change it doesn't necessarily mean your writing is going to get better there's a reason that trope is around so don't dismiss stereotypes just because they're stereotypes they exist for a reason um, a movie can be predictable this is exactly what I was talking about Marvel movies I sometimes enjoy i haven't watched a marvel movie in a long time but they're extremely predictable they might have a little bit of a twist in them but honestly like they're not chinders i mean even chinders list wasn't that unpredictable um that was my cat snoring again um <laughs> he's on my desk a movie can be predictable and still be enjoyable like Nobody watched The Matrix and thought, oh yeah, Keanu Reeves is going to die before the end of the movie. So when he's shot by Agent Smith, spoiler, the movie's 20 years old, at least, uh, you don't go, oh no, Keanu Reeves died. Oh well, of course he's going to win. He's the hero. It's a Hollywood movie. It's still a good movie because you're there for the experience. You're not there for the ending. It can also help lull the players into a false sense of security. Like if you have a stereotypical vampire uh, or at least they're acting as a stereotypical way, the players would be like, oh, the storyteller uh, is a bad storyteller. They're using tropes. Ah, but little did you know that the NPC is just putting on this behavior for appearances. They're actually a lot smarter than you think they are. You can also grow and evolve out of their humble or origins. You can have a stereotype and then have them learn things. Like a lot of times I feel uh, as a storyteller, we feel like a character is set in stone. This is how they behave. We wrote down three lines of personality and then we call it a day. But what if they have a life-changing uh, realization halfway through the first session? What if they're close to death and they're saved by the players? That's going to change them, at least for a while. So be, be ready to rewrite your NPCs and change their behaviors. Uh, people grow. Even vampires grow, albeit slowly, and less so when they get older. But you can definitely... A start with a stereotype and kind of have them grow out of that. That was apparently the last part of that slide, so we'll move on to putting a spin on stereotypes. So here's a couple of clan uh, kindred that are just different from, from their, their stereotype, but still similar. You can have a Banu Hakim public defense lawyer who helps kindred who have trouble with the law. This is still a Banu Hakim, but this is someone who's using their understanding of the law to help others rather than to punish, which is usually the case with the Banu Hakim. You can have a reformist Bruja who's working within the Camarilla for long-term change. I mean, this is a very difficult cause, and the Camarilla changing that is very difficult, but if, if anything, the Bruja are 
uh, are idealists. So this is a reformist Bruja who would rather work within the set perimeters of the Camarilla for, for change rather than to just out, outright oppose it. Like Theo Bell, for example, I would argue was a reformist for a very long time until he finally had enough. You have the social lion gangrel who thrives on the fear and respect of others. They see the social uh, game as a hunting ground. They see themselves as the alpha predator and they enjoy, you know, fighting with others over this kind of social status. <clears throat> You also have the Camarilla ghoul turned Hikata, who was who infiltrates the Giovanni and wants out. Like, yeah, you have a Donny Brasco, that's what it's called, right? Yeah, you have a Camarilla ghoul who who uh, who's a distant cousin to a cousin of the of the Giovanni, and they get embraced. So they're like an inside agent working for the Camarilla or Camarilla in the Hikata, uh, and and they're like terrified of getting found out and killed. So so you have this kind of double double play. Very interesting if you wanted to play a, a Giovanni-focused chronicle or a Hikata chronicle and be like, all right, yeah, I'm actually a, a, a double agent working for the Camarilla, Camarilla because I'm a ghoul there first, or I used to be a ghoul. You can also have a La Sombra investigative journalist who just needs to dig a little bit deeper. I think uh, the main character for um, Shadows Over New York, Shadows of New York, uh, an excellent game, by the way. I think she kind of... Uh, undermines the the Lissandra stereotype quite a bit. She she's an investigative journalist, so she definitely has that survival of the fittest kind of attitude. But she's also someone who does it for justice. She has a belief uh, why, why she do these things. She wants to solve problems. She she she's not very self centered. I I feel like in that game. So she's a, she's an interesting um, undermined stereotype. You can have a Malkavian sheriff working proactively to maintain the peace of the city. Maybe the Malkavian um, has a, a time of lucidity and is helping, you know, helping the caitiff, helping the, the anarchs to sort of have a good representation to stay out of trouble. Uh, maybe they are, um, they have this understanding of people and their needs. So they will, they will use their, their, their powers of insight into making sure that the peace is maintained. Maybe they can even predict trouble before it happens. So they make sure that uh, they, they cut it off at the stem so it doesn't grow into something bigger. You could also have a ministry social worker who's helping guide troubled teens to moderate use of, moderate use of drugs. Like maybe they're just keeping that slight balance of just enough corruption that it doesn't kill the host they're like a parasite working within the system to kind of maintain a status quo that's just just on the edge of what's fine uh, maybe they have prescription medical drugs that have different kind of effects but yeah social worker who's also ministry but not like outright corrupting everything might be an interesting take on the on the stereotype you can have a nosferatu harpy and gossiper who makes it their business to visit everyone they know where everyone lives uh, so they're very chatty, they're very social, very friendly, uh, they get along with other people, uh, and maybe their their uh, clan flaw isn't very clear, or maybe they, they are a very social person regardless. And vampires, vampires generally tend to not care too much about the Nosferatu's looks after a while, because just the same as like how uh, sexism in, in vampire society kind of... Uh, fades away after a while because in the end it's really all about power so sexism is actually a minor thing among vampires uh, the older they get at least according to some books um, just the same way that appearance really stops mattering to a lot of vampires eventually because they get so used to seeing Nosferatu and uh, Hikata or Tsimitsi that they just stop caring about appearance basically so Nosferatu Harpy would be really nice. Like Harpy, of course, is the the social butterfly, the the one who keeps track of boons and social relationships within the Camarilla in their city. You can have a Ravnos keeper of Ravnos, uh, a Ravnos keeper of Elysium, who's loyal to the Camarilla that allows them to indulge in their in their vices and their behaviors. So in return, they have a bunch of different places where they host Elysium, because the Ravnos, of course, can't sleep in the same place for very long. Uh, or they catch on fire in, in V5. I'm not entirely sure how that works. But the Ravnos is basically, they're trusted with finding the perfect locations. Maybe they have a host of nightclubs they have. Maybe they're a casino owner who has a lot of real estate. You know, those kind of things. So a keeper of Elysium is the one who hosts Elysium, basically. You can have a Torador stockbroker and wallflowers. 
who is more interested in the beauty of numbers and the beauty of uh, monetary relationships, who's not very social, who likes to keep to themselves. I think you have... Um, I don't think you have anything like that in Chicago by night, but uh, there's definitely Ventrue's uh, Loden's child hacker. I forgot his name right now, but definitely not a very manipulative social guy. So you can have the same with a Torador, someone who's more into their, their very distinct kind of art, like almost Dwarf Fortress-esque Matrix-like wall of numbers and, and letters. A Tremere prince who works tirelessly to perfect the masquerade of their city. So Tremere, who's definitely in it for the power, but who has decided to uh, prioritize the city and the Camarilla above their clan or their own power pursuit. So they're really working very hard to make sure that the, the, the city runs like clockwork. Uh, Simitsi, plastic surgeon who helps Ktif and Thinbloods escape their hunters, kind of working pro bono uh, to, to change their appearances or even to help other vampires, you know, uh, change how they look, be their best selves, that kind of thing. So Tsimitsi, who's out there to help their fellow kindred to be the best they can be. A venture chief physician, like a venture doctor, who sees healthy kind as a top priority of their city. So maybe they operate out of a hospital and they they really care a lot about the mortals because they think that a healthy city is a city where vampire hunters won't uh, be looking for, for vampires, so to speak. Whew, this is turning out to be a really long video. So you know what? I think actually we're going to cut it here. We're going to continue with social networks, the White Wolf way. We're going to do that in the next video. I got to take a little bit of a break and this video is already an hour long. So in the next video, we'll keep talking about social networks and we'll talk a lot about the other kind of... My God, there's so much stuff to talk about. This might even become three videos now that I think about it. But... We'll continue with another video next week where we'll talk about social networks and that kind of stuff. But for now, thank you for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for your support. And uh, like, comment, subscribe, all those things. Bells on the screen. I don't know how people do that. Uh, but I'm very happy to have you here. I'm happy to making more content. Last week, we didn't make anything because I had a lot of problems with my mouth and I had a cold. You probably heard that I'm a little bit nasal still. Am I talking? That's because I'm still a little bit sick. But thank you very much for sticking around, sticking around with the video and for listening to my slurry rambling wording. I tend to enunciate very poorly. I'm working on that. Uh, anyway, thank you so much. Um, now be safe out there or now remember, be careful out there for Gehenna may soon be upon us. Bye-bye.